Chapter 4 The Prophets 17 of the 39 books of the Old Testament are prophets. Some are quite short, but several others are quite long. Prophets take up almost a third of the pages of the Old Testament. The historical books do, too, but unlike those, the prophets do not contain nearly as much historical narrative and stories, though some do have historical narratives. They are almost exclusively judicial and theological proclamations, as well as predictions of what would come to pass in the future. They are filled with theologically rich imagery and double meanings, usually pointing to the Messiah and his kingdom. The prophets of God had one main mission with two distinct parts to it. They were to bear witness to God's law for Israel, and they were to bear witness to the promises God made to his people. Their witness to the law pertained mainly to the physical people of Old Covenant Israel. The promise applied to them as well, as long as they were people of faith, but overall it has a universal scope. In terms of the mission to bear witness to the law, the prophets were like prosecuting attorneys. They were to act as God's mouthpieces to announce to the nation of Israel how they had departed from the terms of his covenant with them, and to call them to repentance and faithfulness. When judgment was to be pronounced, it was their job to relay the bad news. When the Israelites disobeyed God, they ultimately faced judgment by being exiled from the promised land and taken captive in Assyria and Babylon. The greater spiritual vision of the promise, however, has larger spiritual meanings. It meant that the promised land was not really just the physical land but refers to the whole kingdom of God, a spiritual reality that begins in the hearts of all believers worldwide. The exile was not just the local exile of Babylon, but was a state of mind and a depraved society that included many of the staunchest Israelites themselves. Even when the prophets call down judgment on other nations, it is not so much about Jew versus Gentile, but about faithfulness versus unfaithfulness. So, when Israel or Jerusalem themselves rejected Christ and the New Testament, even they were spiritually, prophetically referred to as Babylon, Egypt, or Sodom, etc. Likewise, the return to the land from exile was not so much a local, physical return to the physical land, but was spoken of as a resurrection of the whole nation, as we shall see from death itself. The prophecies about rebuilding the Jewish temple were not really about a physical temple. In fact, that was actually abominable compared to what God was trying to communicate about it all along. The stack of blocks meant nothing. It was actually about the people of God themselves being inhabited in their hearts by God's presence, The people were to be the dwelling place and sanctuary of God, made holy by his presence. They were to be a temple of living stones that spreads throughout the whole world. When we read the prophets, we must always keep these dual meanings in mind, one directed toward the physical people in their local conditions, and ultimately another directed toward a much larger spiritual picture. What details we have about a few of the prophets shows that God could use anyone as a prophet. Some, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and probably Isaiah, were priests. Others, however, were common folk, like Amos, for example, was a farmer and a herdsman. God often required his prophets to live or act in extraordinary ways. For example, He had Ezekiel carry all his stuff out of his house as one being carried away captive. He was to dig through the walls of his house and walk out during the day in front of everyone, acting out how people would be removed from their homes. Likewise, he had Isaiah walk about barefoot and naked for three years to symbolize how people would be carried away captive in shame. Because God considers his relationship with his people as like a bridegroom and a bride, 
he expresses the nation's faithlessness in pursuit of other gods as spiritual adultery. Ezekiel especially denounces their sin with very graphic depictions of lustful sexual acts. God even had Hosea marry an unfaithful woman whom he knows will commit adultery. This was to be a living depiction of God's marriage to unfaithful Israel. The radical message of the prophets were thus sometimes reinforced through radical behaviors. Our Bibles arrange the order of the prophets in two groups, mainly according to their length. The longer books are called major prophets and the shorter ones minor prophets. There are four major prophets whose account for five books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations by Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The minor prophets consist of the remaining 12 prophetic books. They are sometimes called the 12, not to be confused with the 12 apostles, New Testament, or the 12 tribes of Israel. The prophets did not originally occur in this order, and did not always have the same immediate audience. Some prophets spoke only to the northern kingdom, Israel. Others spoke to the southern, Judah. A few spoke to both kingdoms and appeared to speak partially or even exclusively to nations outside Israel altogether. They all spoke truths that were fulfilled in their own time and then fulfilled again in an ultimate sense during the time of Christ and the Apostles. They all also have enduring, eternal meaning for us today in different ways. Let us look at some key prophecies they contain. Key Prophecies Many prophecies can illustrate the role and message of the prophets, as well as the dual nature of that message. To start with, Hosea gives us a good example of the prophet as a prosecuting attorney delivering the Lord's indictment against a rebellious people. Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being my priest since you have forgotten the law of your God. I will also forget your children. Hosea chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 and verse 6. Many more clearly demonstrate the role of the Messiah to come. Isaiah 53 includes a very famous passage about the crucifixion and suffering of the Messiah for the sins of God's people. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 6. Likewise, in Ezekiel 37, we see a vivid depiction of the return of Israel from captivity. Looking out over a vision of a valley full of dry human bones, God asked Ezekiel if those bones could live. Ezekiel says that only God knows. God commands him to speak to the bones and tell them to live. When he does, the bones stand up and flesh grows and envelops them. God then commands him to tell the winds to enter the bodies as breath. He does and it happens. What stands before him is a mighty army built originally from dry, dead bones. 
Then God explains to Ezekiel, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 12. This passage is highly poetic. It clearly is a reference to the return of the Jews from captivity. But if they were to take it only as that and only for them, they would have missed the larger picture. God intended to rescue people in a much more miraculous way from a much more profound captivity. When Isaiah speaks of the coming kingdom of the Messiah, it takes on a much more global and comprehensive outlook. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations shall flow to it, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 through 4. This vision is not mere tribal or ethnic restoration, but of global peace and reconciliation. This is repeated in a different way when Isaiah speaks of the Messiah's kingdom. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. And the little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Understanding this globally is not so difficult. Understanding it spiritually simply means that something like my holy mountain is not a physical hill in Jerusalem, but the spiritual reality of God's dwelling with us, all of God's people throughout the world. Jeremiah makes clear that what was coming involved more than just national and local deliverance. It was to involve an entirely new covenant and improved relationship with him. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Like a successful marriage, this relationship was to be one of intimate knowledge, love, and inward inspiration to acts of love from the heart. 
The new covenant of the Lord would therefore be global, international, multi-ethnic, and world-changing, beginning with the renewed hearts in individuals' lives. This was a total paradigm shift for many individuals under the Old Testament. It was nothing less than a total recreation of heaven and earth as they knew it, it seemed. So God speaks this way and repeats the vision in exactly these terms. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 and verse 19. As we will see later, the New Testament repeats these promises, citing their fulfillment in Christ. The prophets also contain some interesting concrete predictions that have more definite time frames and references. One of the most intriguing is Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks or more literally 77s. He says, Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness to seal both vision and profit and to anoint the most holy place. He adds more detail. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27. The prince spoken of here is the Messiah. If you follow the time frame of the 77s, 490 years, counting from the time of Artaxerxes given Ezra the decree to start rebuilding the temple or holy place, you will wind up right at the baptism of Jesus around A.D. 27. He is confirmed as the Son of God, then starts his public ministry. After half of another seven, about three and a half years, he is crucified as the final one and only sacrifice for sin. By his sacrifice, he put an end to the old covenant system of the temple offering and sacrifice. Jesus decrees, as we shall see, that the old temple will be desolated and destroyed within that generation. We shall see, in fact, that he directly refers to the prophecies of Daniel when he does so. These themes appear again dramatically as the last words of the Old Testament. Even though the prophets are generally not in chronological order, Malachi is in fact considered to be both the last in the Bible and in history as well until the New Testament era. His very last words of prophecy leave the Jewish people with a reminder of both the coming Messiah and his destruction of the rebellious in the land. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 and verses 5 and 6. The anointing of the holy place in Daniel's prophecy therefore refers to the anointing of Jesus with God's Holy Spirit and later of the anointing of his body, his bride, with the same spirit in the book of Acts. Yet 
That same reality is an outpouring of destruction on the old system, which continually rebelled and disobeyed the Father. We will see the true identity of God's people and his enemies, and we will see the nature of the faith that distinguishes them. Conclusion With the prophets, we get many powerful, vivid images of what God's kingdom built on his promises is really all about. From the time of Eve through Abraham and forward, the promise of a deliverer was to be for all mankind. It was not meant to be a special privilege of real estate and special protection and a sense of national superiority for one small people only. That people was supposed to be a priestly missionary people taking the vision of God's kingdom promises to the whole world. As early as Moses in the law, God said this clearly. He had given them the law to be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. When other nations learned of the, their system of the law and righteousness, they were to exclaim of Israel, What a great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6 and verse 8. Instead, the people of old Israel repeatedly failed to be faithful at Sinai, in the wilderness, during the judges, during the kings, throughout the prophets, and more. It seemed there needed to be something deeper than outward commands to bring about the type of international peace and righteousness of which the law and prophets spoke. Israel had failed in all these things. In the beginning of the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, we will start to see Jesus as the true Israel, the true Son of God, who will face all the same challenges, live out the same events, and yet succeed faithfully. The prophets are filled with both indictments of Israel's failures as well as extensions of hope and mercy and life in the fulfilled promises. That fulfillment had to wait over 400 years as prophecy fell silent and Malachi's final words echoed ominously through the centuries. But Daniel's clock of prophecy was true. The first pages of the New Testament will introduce us to their fulfillments.